Garland from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. We're in for a treat this morning with a truly unique session on the Ukrainian crisis and its effect on the research enterprise. We are very fortunate to have speakers talking to us from Washington, D.C., live from Kiev in the Ukraine, and of course from Madison, Wisconsin. My job is just to let you know to expect a fascinating session and to introduce you to the man who is going to moderate this session. We wanted somebody who was an expert on Eastern Europe, and we found him right here in Madison. I'm so happy to introduce you to my favorite faculty member at Madison, David McLaren McDonald, the Alice D. Mortensen Petrovich Chair of Russian History. David also survived a term as chair of the Department of History and as director of the Center for Research in Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies. He specializes in the Russian Empire from 1721 to 1917, and he's been the recipient of numerous awards for excellence in teaching. He's published widely, and he is a frequently invited speaker at universities around the globe. David, thank you so much for joining us and for agreeing to moderate this session today. Well, thank you, Kim, and welcome everybody. It's nice to see such a strong turnout at this point in the semester, uh, but uh, I think the topic uh, we're going to be dealing with in this panel explains itself, at least in terms of relevance. Uh, we're talking, obviously, to, I won't belabor the title of the, uh, of the session, but I would suggest just to frame our thought in the presentation you're about to hear, there are two veins of discussion that I would see emerging from, uh, from what we're about to hear. One is the obvious one about how uh, institutions, especially those with active research enterprises, how do they adapt to uh, unanticipated crises? Uh, uh, we, of course, have some experience with that in, uh, in terms of the recent uh, uh, or the ongoing COVID uh, pandemic. But uh, I think the drama facing or the, the, the challenges facing Ukrainian universities is even greater since, uh, as you'll learn, our uh, speaker uh, from, uh, from Ukraine, uh, Olga Porkyan, is currently in temporary quarters in Kiev because the city in which her university is housed, Lugansk or Luhansk in, uh, in uh, west eastern Ukraine, is in occupied territory, uh, occupied by the Russian uh, by Russian troops. Um, so that's obvious. The uh, responses to crisis and how do you maintain your core mission? Uh, the second one. Uh, for good reasons and bad is an, an ancillary benefit that I think uh, was unexpected is that uh, uh, it has helped bring to the American mind's eye uh, uh, more attention to Ukraine, which uh, is a flourishing republic uh, in its own right, as we know, and uh, has a long history of excellence in a variety of disciplines in scientific research. And, uh, and so this is a chance to, uh, to think of opportunities to collaborate or to uh, exchange uh, when uh, normality returns to, uh, uh, to their operations. Uh, and judging by the recent headlines and the news we're getting today, about uh, the ongoing counteroffensive in uh, in the province that ho houses uh, uh, Vladimir Dal University, uh, we can hope we hope maybe that's sooner than later. So uh, Sarah covered the technical issues. So what what re uh, remains to me is to present speakers in this panel. I'll do it in reverse order uh, of presentation. Uh, our uh, second speaker will be Natalie Tynan whom I'm sure a lot of you already know. She's the Associate Vice President for Immigration and International Issues with the uh, AAU and has responsibility for immigration, international students and scholars, and other international issues. And, uh, uh, she, and she shares responsibility for other areas such as uh, uh, science and security, export controls, science diplomacy, and related higher ed and, uh, and uh, regulatory matter. Um, our, uh, our guest uh, from, uh, from Ukraine is Olga Parkuyan, who is the rector of Vladimir Dal East Ukrainian National University in the hometown of Vladimir Dal, who was a very distinguished lexicographer in the 19th century. And he was from Lugansk, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, two provinces that has been occupied by the Russian Federation since 2014. Uh, in 2015, Parku Yan was elected as rector, basically president or chancellor of her university, of East Ukrainian National University, uh, before which she had worked as the vice chancellor, vice rector for uh, scientific and international work. Uh, in 2020, 
Uh, she was re-elected to a new term as rector. Uh, her scientific expertise uh, consists of a doctorate in the field of automation of control processes. And she was a professor uh, in the Department of Computer Integrated Control Systems. Uh, she uh, is interested in uh, decision support systems, risk management, modeling, intelligent data, and, and intelligent data analysis. She spent time in the United States for professional development. Had a uh, uh, she was part of the University Administration Support Program uh, run by the International Research and Exchanges uh, Council (IREX). Uh, and in the course of that, she also did a brief internship here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, and, and since March of 2020, she has chaired the uh, Council of Higher Education Institutions Rectors that uh, re relocated from the temporarily occupied territory. So uh, I'm going to, uh, and as Sarah told us, uh, we'll have two presentations. Uh, Professor Parkouyan will talk for about 20, 25 minutes and, uh, and Natalie promises she'll be uh, considerably briefer. And after that, we'll open the floor to questions uh, or we'll start talking about the questions you're free to, to log in with. I'll keep an eye on them during the, these sessions. So, uh, uh, Professor Parkouyan, uh, I invite you to uh, take the microphone and share the screen and uh, we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you again, everybody, for your attention. Dear friends, Please accept greetings from me personally and from the all academic and scientific community of Ukraine. Thank you very much for the invitation, especially Kim Moland, and for the opportunity to share information with you, dear colleagues. I am rector of um, Volodymyr Dal East Ukrainian National University. And in my speech, I want to show directly from our experience how the war um, affected uh, the research environment in Ukrainian universities. And now I want uh, to share my screen. Over the past eight years uh, since the beginning of the Russian aggression in 2014, when Crimea was annexed and part of the Eastern regions, who occupied our university has been experiencing, experiencing the second relocation. In 2014, there were in Ukraine 17 such displaced universities. And now in 2022, this number has increased significantly. About 30 universities, 40 colleges and 65 educational institutions are forced to move to new places. And um, the space universities have become a phenomenon of higher education in Ukraine and uh, an example of resilience, a desire for development, even in difficult conditions of um, existence near the front line and uh, permanent uh, military actions. Uh, but first, uh, I want to provide brief information about the university that I had. It was founded in 1920 in Luhansk, um, the center of the easternmost region of Ukraine. The main areas of research and educational activity were technical sciences, economics, psychology, philology, sociology, law, and others. The university was one of the largest educational institutions in the country in terms of the number of students, the number of teaching staff, the powerful material and technical laboratory and scientific base located in 57 educational laboratory buildings. The university and uh, in an extensive network of 10 branches located in Crimea, Luhansk and uh, other regions, more than 2000 students, uh, sorry, uh, 2,000 teachers taught to more than 30,000 students, include foreign students. The university has um, always held leading positions in the national rankings of scientific and educational activities of Ukraine. The university community was focused on development, research, and social activity. However, the ambitious development plans of the university were heated 
by the 2014 war. In the summer of 2014, the premises of the base university in Luhansk were seized by the occupied occupiers and uh, looted. Anti-aircraft guns were installed in the courtyard of the students' dormitories. Also, all branches were seized, except for one in the city of Severodonetsk, Luhansk region. The university staff, most of the teachers and students, were transferred to the base of this branch. Many employees were in a very difficult psychological state due to the fact that they lost all their property, their housing. Uh, many of them, elderly or sick uh, parents, could not leave. They remained in the occupied territory. In 2014, we all understood that the university is not about buildings, walls, and equipment, but first of all, it is people, human potential. For many, the university became um, that nucleus around which one could rally and uh, which motivated one to think about the future, plan something in a new place, reevaluate one's life and priorities. It was then and now again. Dedicated work of employees during 2014, 2022 uh, uh, made it possible to restore educational and scientific activities, create new sites and laboratories. The university has significantly improved its failed in 2014-2015 positions in the national rankings. Just for the last eight years, the university has implemented more than 50 international and national projects, created 16 new laboratories and more than multifunctional educational spaces with the help of our international partners and sponsors. We are very grateful to all organizations, institutions, and people for their help and support, without which it would have been very difficult for us in those years, and even more so now. Many projects were implemented thanks to the participations of the American people. These are projects supported by USAID. In recent years, the university has very actively cooperated with USAID, Economic Resilience Activity and DG East programs. According to these programs, it was planned to create a modern IT school at the university, as well as several specialized labo laboratories for the development of the scientific field of electric vehicle design. I will say a few words about the city of Severodonetsk, where the university resumed its activities. A compact and uh, cozy city with uh, approximately 150 inhabitants, but many research institutions and knowledge-intensive industries functions in it cooperation with which greatly contributed to the organization of higher quality education for students of technical specialities after the loss of uh, the research base. Here is one example. A permanent partner of our university is the research and production enterprise Impulse, a leading Ukrainian manufacturer of um, automatic control system for nuclear energy and railways. The company's products is used in many countries and of course in Ukraine, and in particular at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant occupied now by the Russian army. At the company Impulse, our students underwent practical training and internships. But on February 24, 2022, Severodonetsk, like many other cities, was shelled by Russian troops. Today, the research and production base of Impulse has been completely destroyed. The rest of the university's uh, partners, enterprises, are in similar situation. The building of our university also suffered significant, significant destruction as a result of Russian shelling. The academic building of the university uh, practically destroyed, partly destroyed the laboratory building. 
in which new laboratories and uh, working areas were created. The dormitory and the building of our college suffered significant damage. Uh, while working in Sergeyevsk, some employees have already bought apartments and set up a new life. Some families have given birth to children, but the war forced people to leave their homes again. The ceiling of Severodonetsk began in the first days of the full-scale invasion of the Russian army. The entrance to the administrative building of the university was closed by the Ukrainian military. The administration and the rectorate of the university worked online. The location for the move in the university was immediately determined after consultation with ministry. Um, it is a small town in the west of Ukraine, as far as possible from the war zone. Some of the employees urgently left the city on the first day, February 24. A part remained because people did not yet understand what was happening. At the same time, the situation wasn't sharply. The selling became very powerful and dense. It was dangerous to even go outside from the shelter. In such conditions, university employees took responsibility not only for, for the safety of their families, but also for the lives of our students. Those students who remained in Severodonetsk were rolled in, the, in a dormitory in the old part of the city, which was less shelled. Later, this hostel became the hub through which we organized the evacuation. Uh, on the second day of the war, an uh, online coordination group was created in the Telegram channel to coordinate the actions of those who remained in Severodonetsk and then to organize the evacuation. The evacuation took place in very dangerous conditions, under shelling, under, um, and um, there were no humanitarian corridors. In such conditions, the official authorities could not ensure the removal of people, take responsibility for their lives. So the evacuation took place at one's own risk. People walked through the whole city under fire to the hostel where buses were waiting for them to take them out of, of the city. It was necessary to coordinate everything in conditions of practically no communication. There was no electricity, water and heat in almost the entire city. The temperature at the time was 12, 14 Fahrenheit. Employees of the university with the support of volunteers coordinate this process. Rented buses, which after transporting employees, students and uh, members of their families transported other um, residents of Severodonetsk. For about three weeks, we were evacuating people, about 5,000 residents of the region in total. Most of the students were evacuated to safe cities, but some students who were at home with their parents when the aggression began did not have time to leave their territories, uh, the territories captured uh, in the first days and remain under occupation. Thus, during the first uh, two weeks, approximately 90% of teachers and students were evacuated. The university continued to function in new locations. Now there are three of them in the city of Kamenets Podolsky, in the city of Dnipro, and in the Kiev. The first questions which again faced the university today are the solution of humanitarian problems. The dormitory rooms, um, which were provided to us by our colleagues in new cities, uh, had not been used for some time and needed furniture, uh, household appliances, uh, dishes, um, bed lining, etc. Almost everyone left with a minimum number of things. 
To solve all these issues, evolve the war engage public organizations. The balances of these grants in agreement with donors uh, were used to meet uh, the urgent needs of people. We are very grateful to everyone who helped us during this difficult time. The way to success starts here, is the slogan of our university. We teach students leadership. It was they who joined volunteer activities and helping residents during evacuation from the first days. Some of them defend our state with weapons in their hands. And unfortunately, some die in this war. Our students are incredible. They help in whatever way they can. They wear camouflage nets, join cyber troops, donate blood for wounded fighters and civil civilians, do a lot of small things, components of our future great victory. I talk about all these events in such detail because they determine the psychological state in which all my colleagues and students are now forced to work not only of our university, but also of other displaced universities. The impact of the war on the educational and scientific environment is total and um, diverse. To systematize briefly, the following aspects uh, can be identified. First and obvious, the physical destruction of building of universities and other institutions, material-based infrastructure as a result of shelling and bombing. Currently, there are still no complete data on the destruction and loss of the infrastructure of Ukraine as a result of the war. According to the latest official reports, 90 of the 230 scientific institutions of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine are damaged. 20 universities and colleges were destroyed, and uh, 140 were damaged. Secondly, the difficult psychological state of teachers, scientists, and students due to the loss of loved ones, housing, property, constant danger, and uncertainty. In addition, the dispersion of scientific personnel throughout the country and abroad may lead to the collapse of scientific schools. Some employees remained in the occupied territories, unable to live, unable to study or work due to lack of connection with these territories. The results of study, which I have um, of studying the situation, testified to serious crisis process in the scientific field as a result of the war in Ukraine. The situation in the financing of science is becoming critical. Thus, uh, more than 30% uh, of scientists who worked on uh, certain projects noted that their projects were stopped because of the war. This is primarily due to the deprivation of funding uh, from the National Research Fund. Um, as of today, Ukraine has not yet held a single competition for financing scientific research. We understand for all us, the main priority is to support the armed forces of Ukraine. Finally, one more aspect, the loss of traditional customers of scientific developments and uh, scientific and technical services by universities in connection with uh, closing of industrial enterprises, and their destruction or the impossible of evacuating business from the occupied territory. Uh, during the war, opportunities for international assistance opened up for Ukrainian scientists. How are the tools? of such assistance uh, mostly concern only that small part of scientists who went abroad um, and the vast majority of them remained in Ukraine. 
the war forces to review the priorities of scientific research in the direction of increasing defense capability and security. According to the result of a survey, more than 70% of the scientists are ready to work uh, on rebuilding and increasing the defense capability of our state. I will also note all educational and scientific institutions have served scientific ties with research institutions and organizations of Russia and Belarus. In conclusion, I would like to say again, the terrible impact of war is not only lost premises and material base, but first of all, it is a deep psychological and emotional impact on people. Despite all the difficulties, the educational process as a university continues, as does part of the research. However, uh, most scientific projects cannot be continued, uh, continued due to the loss of the laboratory base. The situation is the same throughout the country. People are under terrible stress, but is this state, they continue to work, start new projects and help their armed forces. Today, Ukraine needs comprehensive support, and we will also need support for recovery after the end of the war, after the victory. Russia's aggression is not only a crime against a free country, but also against humanity and the entire world system. The Ukrainian people directly encountered this true savagery, a return to the times of barbarism, which um, threatens all humanity. Accordingly, this evil, accordingly, uh, this evil can only be stopped by the world. world. And I am very grateful to all of you for the fact that the USA stands with Ukraine in this struggle. Thank you to everyone present and to the entire American people for the support supporting Ukraine in its desire for victory. We are sure of Ukraine's victory. We are united with the American people by an innate desire for freedom. And glory to Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Prokryan. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll await questions and we see some coming in. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll uh, hand the uh, floor over to uh, Natalie Tynan. Uh, and I should have mentioned at the outset, she herself has uh, uh, some uh, Ukrainian background in her family tree. So uh, I will look forward to your comments, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, hi, I am Natalie Tynan and uh, I am honored to be here to speak with you today, and um, I would like to acknowledge that my great-grandfather immigrated from Kyiv to the United States prior to World War I. So Ukrainian blood is pretty strong in my family, and these issues are very close to heart. So I am the Associate Vice President of Immigration and Global Issues for the Association of American Universities. AAU is comprised of 65 top tier science and research institutions, including two in Canada. Our membership universities are in the majority of competitively awarded federal funding for research that improves public health, seeks to address national challenges and contributes to our economic strength while also educating and training tomorrow's leaders. So I am going to speak with you about the impact of the war in Ukraine on the scientific and higher education community in the United States, as well as some of the interactions we've had with international organizations. So I have to begin by acknowledging that the Russian invasion of Ukraine 
instigated the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II. The Russian military continues to employ brutal battlefield tactics that target civilians and civilian infrastructures, such as homes and schools. So there have been 14,000 civilian casualties, though I expect this number to rise as Ukraine continues to take back territory and as cities like Mariupol uh, are eventually assessed for uh, the, the loss of human life. So since February 24th, approximately 12 million Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes. Seven million have sought refuge in another country, Poland being the primary destination. And Poland has just provided an incredible amount of hospitality, warmth and acceptance to these people who pretty much fled with the clothes on their back. The United States was not an initial destination for Ukrainian refugees because of pretty much one simple fact. They did not want to be far from their homeland where men between the ages of 18 and 60 are subject to martial law and cannot leave the country. However, since the beginning of the war, policies have been instituted that help encourage Ukrainian nationals to come to the United States. In April, President Biden announced the Uniting for Ukraine initiative, which provides a pathway for Ukrainian citizens and their immediate family members who are outside of the United States to come here for a temporary two-year period. The administration also uh, announced an 18-month designation of temporary protected status for Ukraine that's effective until October 19th and in my best estimate will likely be extended for another 18 months. And TPS allows Ukrainian nationals to live and work in the United States for the 18 month period. It does not provide a pathway to a green card. In addition to TPS, special student registration relief was made available to Ukrainian students. So SSR provides flexibility for students. For example, you can obtain a work authorization document, adjust your course load to incorporate additional work hours. And this is especially geared towards students who have a loss of funding or find themselves just unable to pay for their tuition. So within the science, and higher education community, the horrific and unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine was widely condemned. The research community and leading research universities, in cooperation with U.S. government agencies, are working to initiate their own efforts to support Ukrainian scientific and higher education enterprise, as well as Ukrainian students and scholars. We are aware that as many as 40% of the Ukrainian scientific community has either been killed or displaced by the Russian invasion, and that many top universities and research institutions have been destroyed. Speaking for AAU, our campuses responded quickly to the crisis in Ukraine. They issued statements of support, provided emergency funding, provided free summer tuition and housing, administrative flexibility, and increased immigration-related support. They also provided critical emotional and mental health services to effective students. Many of our schools work with the Science in Exile organization or scholars at risk to help provide relief to the Ukrainian scientific community. Many of them partner either directly with Ukrainian institutions of higher education or with the Ukrainian Global University. 
to provide fellowships, exchange programs, and access to online learning. AAU was particularly honored to host Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky back in May for a discussion on how the US scientific community can help Ukraine. Our presidents and chancellors heard firsthand a moving in moving and inspirational remarks from President Zelensky, how Ukraine embraces education as part of their national identity and its fight for sovereignty and democracy. So from our perspective, education is Ukraine's future, quite literally. The current situation though is dire and concerns about brain drain were Ukrainian scientists and innovators leaving the country and never coming back remain high. Approximately 22,000 or a quarter of Ukraine scientists and research have left. 20% of them are expected to remain abroad permanently. These scientists and research and researchers left behind decades of their research, data, and other scientific assets. The loss of this work and material will be felt for years to come. But many displaced Ukrainian students and researchers hope to come back and resume their studies and research in Ukraine. And I might add at the beginning of the war, a lot of the feedback that we received was that the science and research community was on the front lines. They're fighting with their fellow citizens against the Russians to protect their country. So the immediate scientific and education concerns were, were very much superseded by the will to fight um, and their bravery is uh, astonishing and admirable. So AAU has been working with organizations such as the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, as well as encouraging US institutions to use existing exchange programs and relationships to find seats and classes and places for Ukrainian scientists to live and to safely live and work while this crisis plays out. Uh, we are actively engaged with organizations like Scholars at Risk and Scholars in Exile to continue the dialogue about immediate needs, future needs, what rebuilding of this educational infrastructure might look like. In addition, numerous international scientific organizations, such as the Science for Ukraine Initiative in Latvia, and young scientists from the World Economic Forum provide advocacy for Ukrainian scientists, facilitate exchange programs, and help preserve research assets. Mobilizing the internal, the international science community to use their networks and connections to relay information and amplify messages through social media is critical to keeping the Ukrainian scientific community engaged and informed, and that provides a network of support so they hopefully will not feel forgotten or left out. And hopefully this provides a lifeline for those scientists and researchers who are struggling to maintain their professional status and who want to continue their research and education. Another thing I'd like to note is the ripple effect of the war. It's being felt across the globe, and I just wanted to mention a few topics of concern. The first is energy. <clears throat> Russia is the largest supplier of fossil fuels to Europe, and it has now closed off those supplies, causing European governments to find alternative supplies and to try to mitigate the economic impact, especially as winter is quickly approaching. This has added 
to concerns about recession and inflation that the world is dealing with coming out of the COVID-19 crisis and then factoring in an energy crisis. Food supply. Ukraine supplies one quarter of the world's grain supply. However, with the Russian military blocking access to Black Sea ports, the ability to distribute grain is dramatically reduced. And this will particularly impact countries in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. And my last point here is nuclear safety. Uh, concerns were already heightened by the fact that a nuclear power invaded a sovereign independent country. And the fact that Ukraine has 15 functional nuclear reactors, including Chernobyl and Zaporizhia, which is the largest nuclear reactor in Europe. These reactors provide 51% of the power in Ukraine uh, and Zaporizhia is currently occupied by the Russians and has seen shelling in and around the area that has brought down external power lines to the Soviet era reactor. Okay, so what comes next? How can AAU and the scientific research community help Ukraine rebuild? Estimated costs of rebuilding Ukraine range from 750 billion to 1 trillion, and that number keeps climbing as the war continues. It will take a whole of society effort to rebuild a sovereign, democratic, strong Ukraine. And in addition, education, which was already fundamentally changed with the fall of the Soviet Union, continues to be a focal point. Modernization of a system that was built under the Soviet empire has been key and challenges include removing or de-emphasizing the role of the state in education, removing ideology and Russification and promoting academic autonomy. Moving to Western standards will help further integrate the scientific and research community internationally, which will then lead to further collaborations, scientific study, publications, and the list just goes on. So part of this process is going to require new infrastructure uh, to rebuild because many of the schools are unusable. It also requires updated classrooms, digital libraries, modern day lab equipment, and so much more. We can help Ukraine establish traditions that we hold dear in our own institutions, ideas of academic freedom, openness, and autonomy by showing them how we do it. We can help train scientists and researchers in critical areas such as agriculture, geology, and mineralogy, where Ukraine can then build out its economy and strengthen its national security. So in closing, Ukraine is fighting for its life. It's fighting for freedom and self-determination, just as this country did almost 250 years ago. We know what is at stake, and we have as a nation and as a people fully supported Ukraine. Ukraine believes they will win and are looking to the future. Their leaders and Ukrainian society recognize that rebuilding and modernizing their education system is funda fundamental to national security <clears throat> and economic stability and prosperity. We understand that we have a responsibility to help. And while the landscape continues to change as the war rages, it is important to have these conversations now so that we can be ready when the time is right. As we look to the future and an end to this war, we hope to see Ukraine as a robust partner in the scientific and higher education community. And with that, I hand it back to you, David.
you, <laughs> thank you, Natalie. Uh, very clear and very helpful presentation. Uh, we, we're now uh, happy to open the floor to questions. Uh, I've already got a, a few from the uh, uh, on my docket, but uh, several audience members wanted me to convey their thanks to uh, to Olga for such uh, for such a helpful presentation. Um, Dick Seligman, Seligman from uh, the research administrator at Caltech, uh, wrote to ask uh, uh, what can American or what can faculty administrators in the United States do to help their Ukrainian colleagues. And they'd really like to hear Olga's answer to that. Uh, and Kim Moreland asks, uh, how do you maintain contact with your students, faculty, and staff in these dispersed conditions? And again, that's for uh, for Olga. So uh, uh, Olga, I invite you to uh, to answer if you've got any insights, please. Now, a university um, works on three locations in uh, the city Kamnes Podolsky, yeah. in the west of Ukraine, in uh, Dnipro, and in, uh, in Kyiv. Um, and um, some employees uh, is in Kyiv, are in Kyiv, and um, we uh, together. Uh, uh, do our job and um, but um, we with other our colleagues um, we connect um, through internet uh, or uh, mobile uh, connection and um, now we have uh, distance learning in uh, university and um, we we want uh, to have strong uh, connection with uh, each student because uh, some of them uh, now are on uh, occupy, uh, occupied uh, territory um, and um, and second uh, question oh uh, uh, so uh, how do you maintain contact and the uh, the, the first one was uh, on uh, what can American universities and uh, faculty administrators do to uh, support? Uh, you and your colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the in the University of Wisconsin Medicine, I see I saw that the level of the research um, in this university and uh, in the other university is very high, and um, the experience of our American colleagues is very useful for for us. Um, um, I think that um, this uh, experience um, should um, share uh, through the um, Ukrainian researchers um, in any way. <laughs> and um, now USA give um, very strong uh, support uh, for Ukraine, and uh, I I very grateful for this. Um, I think that um, we can uh, say about um, joint projects, for example, um, about um, about more contact between our researchers and uh, American researchers. Um, I think that uh, there are many ways. Um, how, how we can um, use your experience because now we think about future, about recovery and um, um, we would like that um, this recovery um, will be modern, will be better than we had in the uh, past. Great, thank you. I, I've got a question of my own. Uh, have you and your colleagues from other universities in East Ukraine and Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, the, the province, have you uh, established any contact with uh, with Ukrainian universities abroad? And I'm thinking of the Free University, Free Ukrainian University in Munich, or the network, the uh, University Global, the Ukrainian Global University. Uh, have these proven at all helpful in your uh, in your in your current uh, current state, 
I'm sorry, I uh, don't understand. We have a strong contact with all Ukrainian university. Uh, okay. But uh, I, I don't know. Um, all university um, now in Ukraine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If you uh, ask about university uh, which evacuated from Ukraine. Yes, I'm talking about the Free University, the Free Ukrainian University in Munich, and then the U Ukrainian oh, Global University. Unfortunately, I, I, I haven't uh, contacted with uh, okay. the university in Munich. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I may jump in. Please. Um, the Ukrainian Global University has been very successful with our schools. It's um, a consortium of universities. It has some government support mm -hmm. and it enables our schools to arrange fellowships, um, to award grants, to, to facilitate exchange programs. So many of our schools, and it allows you to vary your level of participation. So it can be one scholar, it can be, you know, something bigger than that if you wanted it to be. But many of our schools are involved in that. Yeah, well, good, good. That's good to hear. And I can add on my part that I, I was on a committee at UW-Madison for how we might accommodate or support uh, scholars fleeing Ukraine. And uh, one of the concerns that, that came up in our committee and that was shared by our colleagues, we tended to be mostly humanists and social scientists, but uh, uh, a lot of our colleagues in the sciences were very interested in offering support, but also they had in mind the long-term interests of Ukraine and wanted to be uh, sure that they weren't really poaching resources from a uh, from an already uh, strapped uh, research uh, enterprise. So uh, I think that has surfaced as a, as a concern among a, among a lot of our colleagues across the country. It, it's definitely a concern, and it's a concern within my my colleagues as well. And one thing that we've been talking about are creating more robust exchange programs. Mm -hmm. So, and, and making those programs focused on issues that are most advantageous to Ukraine. So geology and mineralogy, sure. agriculture. So there's the expectation that however they're brought here, they would be taking that knowledge back home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's also through the Ukrainian Global University. That's also a way. Yeah, yeah. But, and I, I know at the risk of waving a, a, a different flag, uh, I'm originally from Canada, and I know that the, uh, the ties between uh, Canadian universities and Ukraine are uh, very well developed uh, because they're in Canada, it's a very pr prominent part of uh, our population by ethnicity. Uh, um, uh, can you reach out to them for, uh, for advice or contact or uh, their uh, possibilities that, uh, that might, not be, might not be appearing on American screens? And two of our member schools are yeah. Canadian, so they are actively involved mm -hmm. and, and have been part of these discussions. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think that's exhausted the questions I've got so far. Are there, are there any other issues that interest people in the audience? Yeah. David, I, I talk faster than I type. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to ask, um, perhaps both Natalie and Olga, we were talking about resources for the Ukraine and how Ukrainian researchers can possibly continue their work in the face of tremendous loss of data, of facilities, of equipment, of spirit to some extent, because this must be debilitating. And I think that many of us have made small donations to various causes in the Ukraine, whether it's for food or, or whatever it might be. But I'm curious, both Natalie and Olga, how do, you, how do we help find a balance between support for education and research versus support for the ongoing well-being of the population? Because this is such a 
it, it is a situation that we in the U.S. have not encountered, fortunately, within our boundaries. And David, you might you might want to shrink that question uh, <laughs> for me. Yeah, what what are the most effective means of, especially donations and material support, financial support that uh, our communities can offer to their Ukrainian counterparts, given the the multi-dimensional nature of the challenges that face you. And well, I guess you can answer that and as well as I'm sure Natalie uh, has some understanding of this. I'm sorry, David, can you help me translate? Are, are there any special funds or any uh, organizations to which American scholars can donate, can, can make uh, donations in support of Ukrainian science? I, I don't understand. Uh, what what do you want uh, to hear from me? Well, is there is there any organization, uh, even at the national level or the federal level in Kiev, that American scholars can make money donations to to support mm -hmm. Ukrainian science? We have many. Uh, civil organization which you can uh, get uh, donate. Mm -hmm. um, if you could send us a list of those afterwards, we'd be grateful and we'd share it. Okay. I, I would also yes, I can send. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Natalie. Uh, I would also add that uh, the Ukrainian government and it's the name of it is escaping me, but they've launched, uh, I think it's United for Ukraine or something to that effect that is hosted by the Ukrainian government and it provides different ways to provide financial support. Um, for instance, if you go into the military section, you can buy part of a weapon. You can um, earmark your funds for that. You can go into education and earmark donations for that. Uh, so I would, I would say, you know, that's worth looking at. And then, in terms of the nature of the help, uh, which I think was kind of part of Kim's question, we've taken our lead from the Ukrainians, um, as I noted at the beginning the scientific community wanted was fighting and they still are fighting and that was their priority and they weren't ready to think about anything beyond what was going on on the ground we're seeing a little we're seeing more conversation some of it headed by the ministry of science and education in ukraine um, some of it headed by international organizations that are talking about next steps. So in terms of finding a balance, I, I just recommend taking the lead from your colleagues that are in Ukraine or that have knowledge of what's going on on the ground. Great, good, thank you. Um, starting to get some more questions uh, 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 for you, uh, Natalie. Some members of our community have advocated that we bar Russian scientists from publishing in our journals or presenting talks at our conferences. U.S. sanctions are also involved, but there are a lot of reasons to keep some some collaborations going. Uh, what should we do? And I've I've faced this even in, in my own uh, humanistic area, but uh, I'd be interested to hear your response. So AAU has taken the position that collaboration with Russian scientists should continue. That that it's not productive to shut out a portion of the world. That is after you take into consideration compliance with, with sanctions and also some federal limitations. Uh, President Biden did put out an announcement that official lines of communication with Russian universities was being discouraged but that still leaves the one-on-one -on -one collaborations, the personal relationships. Um, you know, it, it leaves a whole host of things that that can continue. 
again, I would, yeah, that's a use position. And mm -hmm. I would recommend evaluating the circumstances of that research. I think one example of climate research that has been significantly impacted because you can't get into Russia to continue the Arctic level research that was going on there. And years and years of data is going to be lost because of that. Yep. Yep, uh, quite true. No, no, that's a uh, it's very helpful. And as I say, we face the same problems in our field. I, I'm uh, one of three general editors of a huge international research publication project, and about a hundred of our 340 contributors are Russian. And uh, we, we're having very interesting discussions among ourselves. A lot of it's already been published, but uh, there's still a few things coming out. Uh, do we accept them? And it's uh, it's hard to hard to do as a blanket. Uh, policy and I think the AU's policy is uh, is, is a good one. But uh, uh, now I've got uh, a question for Olga. Uh, was it all possible to save equipment when you to save any lab equipment when you were ha had to move out of Lugansk into uh, the uh, new locations? Mm, only a small part of our equipment. We left um, mm, mm, normals okay okay and uh, i uh, i would like to say that um, it's very sad that i hear about um, russian researchers because um, i saw later uh, where rectors of a russian university support uh, aggression, uh, support uh, this um, war. And uh, <laughs> for me, it's, 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 it's very, very sad. Yeah, okay, no, that, that's helpful, thank you. Um, I've also got a question from, uh, or I've got a very helpful link that I'll share to the whole uh, board when, uh, when, uh, when I can get on that, uh, that gives a, it reports on an effort uh, by the uh, National Academies to uh, uh, help provide support to uh, uh, researchers, Ukrainian researchers, as they resettle in Poland. And then the same uh, same donor, same uh, texter uh, pointed to the Safe Passage Fund administered by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So uh, those are two very helpful destinations. Um, and uh, Another attendee remarking on how do you maintain contacts with your Russian collaborators? Should we follow CERN's example to continue existing collaborations but not start new ones? And I'll defer again to the uh, to the experts in this field. I'm not sure I can advise whether to start or stop. I think that's a a, a very you know intense decision that needs to be made based on the research and the circumstances at hand. Um, you know, as far as I know, avenues of communication are not closed off with Russia, but that you need to be aware of the political circumstances, um, aware of the level of control the Russian government has over um, over its people um, and take all of that into consideration as you move forward. Yes, yes, I think it's good advice. Um, I've been struck though by how many of my colleagues have pretty good VPN connections that allows them to that allow them to obviate some of the most obvious areas of intrusion. So, uh, uh, but uh, still there, there is a fundamental ethical challenge there too, or a set of issues. So, so uh, case by case, as they say. Uh, uh, another messenger wants to know, but in addition to supporting scholars uh, embarked on research in the field, how do we support students who are trying to continue to get an education in the midst of the war? And I know the Poles, the Polish government has provided means uh, any other measures that we know of? Um, I, Olga, do you want to go first? Um, 
I, I, I can propose um, additional fees for students. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I know that some of our universities have leveraged their connections in Europe to provide scholarship money, room and board to get seats in classes. Um, you know, it's harder when you're speaking from the United States and asking people in a very traumatic situation to go even further from home. But all of our schools have made efforts to recruit Ukrainian students to support the ones that we have here in the United States um, to, to look at collaborations like the NASM collaboration in Poland. Um, and, and through the Ukrainian Global University, that's kind of been a mainstay since the war has begun uh, for our schools that, that really want to help, even if it's providing distance education, providing free access to online learning, um, maybe providing equipment to do that. Uh, for people who are displaced, um, for Ukrainian faculty that's in Europe trying to maintain connections with their students back in Ukraine. So there are a multitude of initiatives going to, to try to help support and encourage Ukrainian students to continue in their studies. Another uh, aspect of this is trying to partner with Ukrainian universities so that when a degree is awarded, it can be awarded jointly. So it would be the American University and a Ukrainian university that are both issuing the degree and that, that helps the student keep a connection to the home. Um, and, and it's something that the Ukrainian government has, has been particularly um, looking to do. Good, thank you. Very helpful. Uh, well, I got, I'm I'm getting s several requests uh, asking whether or not you have a written copy of your remarks, and uh, and obviously the slides. And would you be willing to share those? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can send after the session. Please, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, you. Any other questions? Again, we're in a, a quiet spell. And I distributed that link uh, that I was talking about earlier just now. So you should have that in your, uh, in your chat boxes. David, I'll pop back on again and just say, it appears maybe we have come to the end of this session. I, I want to thank you, Natalie, and of course, Olga, for taking the time and making the effort to have comments that inform us and that move us as well. We appreciate it so much. Um, we will look forward to continuing this collaboration and to providing what assistance we can to the Ukraine. So thanks to all of you for this session. I appreciate it enormously. Thank Any you. last remarks from the panel? Just to restate that it's been an honor uh, to be here to speak with you and that uh, you're right. It is not just about the science. It's, it's a, a belief in democracy. It's a belief in in peace and stability in the world. And the Ukrainians are on the forefront of that and we want to support them. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. And um, I hope that um, this uh, meeting will have a uh, continuum and um, maybe a new collaboration uh, between Ukrainian and uh, American universities. It uh, it was very useful for me personally, and uh, thank you for all that you 
do for supporting Ukraine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Oiga, and uh, thank you, Natalie, for your contributions. I'll just recur to one point I made at the outset of this uh, session is that if there's any good coming out of the current awful situation, it's that it's uh, made Ukraine uh, newly visible to American audiences. And I think for too long, uh, we were always preoccupied with the Russian question, uh, especially after the uh, the wall fell, the, the uh, old uh, Warsaw Pact states uh, became uh, uh, functionally independent after 89. And Ukraine has always been in the shadow of, uh, of Russia in a lot of the Western imaginary. And this gives us a chance to understand how distinctive and uh, how deeply, uh, how deeply rooted Ukrainian culture and enterprise are, and uh, and to start thinking of Ukraine uh, in ways that recognize its uh, its uh, distinctiveness, its independence, and uh, its potential value is a very helpful partner, especially in the disciplines that Natalie was saying, uh, ag sciences and uh, even uh, nuclear engineering for uh, in, in some contexts. But uh, uh, so thank you very much for your attention and for your time. I know you're getting close to uh, lunchtime and that's uh, to be considered and, and uh, we'll get to, uh, to dinner. So uh, we won't detain you from either any longer. Uh, thank you for your uh, contributions. Thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. We can all leave now. <laughs>